Thank you, choir. Beautiful as always. I have a warning for you. When you send a preacher like me on vacation for two weeks, look out the day he gets back because he's got a lot pent up inside to say. Amen? I'll try to, try to keep it under control because I know you want to do some other things today. What I'm going to do is to preach the sermon that I prepared and talk a little bit about pride this morning. So give me an extra five minutes maybe and we'll be ready to go. Maybe ten. I love you, honey. <laughs> Discipleship. What does it mean and really what is it? How do we become disciples? Why would we want to? And are we disciples already or are we working on becoming disciples? Discipleship. What does it mean to you and what does it mean to God? Would you pray with me? God, we've come together in this place this morning to hear your voice. We want to follow you with our hearts and our minds and with every part of our being. Teach us and guide us this day. Amen. Amen. I have to admit to you, upon arriving back from vacation this week, I was very tempted just to go in my file and put, pull out the sermon that I preached three years ago on this Sunday in the lectionary, which would have been the exact same readings, and it would have been very easy. However, you probably know me better than that by now, so I took this little nagging voice inside of me and listened to it that God might have something unique to say to to us this year and I resisted that urge to pull out an old sermon and at six o'clock one morning dug into it all over again and so what is discipleship let me share some ideas with you from the anchor Bible dictionary which I often use in my study the operative verb used in the original manuscripts means to follow or to walk behind a basic concept is that we become disciples when Jesus calls us to do so. The good news that we see in scripture today is that all of us, every one of us, has received that calling from God to become disciples, to become, as I call it, followers of Jesus. When Jesus said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of people, he meant you and me and all of the rest of us with no exceptions. Now discipleship becomes a little more difficult because the original intent of becoming a disciple of Jesus meant a complete breaking apart from one's past. It meant being willing to leave our homes and our families and our businesses and our communities where we've grown roots deeply and to follow Jesus wherever he went. It meant giving up old ways for new ways, giving up old habits for new habits, giving up old behaviors for new ones. It meant, and I think it still does, establishing a fundamental life relationship with Jesus Christ and not just his teaching, but also his way of living. Finally, at least for this sermon, becoming a disciple meant being sent out to do something. I love that language that says, I'm on a mission from God. But be careful how you use that because it might scare people if you're really serious about it, and it should. It means that you and I have experienced a high calling, one that puts us in a divine place and purpose for our lives. It means that you and I are called to do something different. It means that people look at us and say, those people are kind of odd. Those people are different. I wonder what happened to them, or maybe even, I want some of that. I wonder how they got into that place in their lives. And some of these callings are very general ones when it says, come follow me. But some of them, I assure you, are very specific. And what I mean to, by that is that these callings, these specific ones, apply to you personally. They are callings that only you can fulfill. I cannot fulfill 
fulfill your calling, God's calling on your life. I'm not able to do it. They are specific to you and you are the only person that can live out God's calling on your life. I can't do it. The deacons can't do it. The board can't do it. And for the record, your mama and your daddy and your granddaddy couldn't do it either because it belongs to you. You cannot just stand on the ancestors that you share in faith because God's calling for you is for you only. And the absolute truth simply stated is that only you can fulfill God's calling on your life. Now, we see examples of that in our community all over the place. We can't help but remember on a Pride Sunday in MCC, but almost at the 40th anniversary of our denomination, the calling that God placed on the life of Troy Perry, having been thrown out of his church, having been divorced by his wife, having attempted suicide, and God just kept whispering in Troy's voice, I have plans for you. And I love what Troy says when, when he talks about this scene, and he says, I heard the voice of God saying, stop telling me what I can't do. I love you. I did not make a mistake on the day that you were born, and I have a plan for you. And my sister Sisters and brothers, I want you to hear that voice of God saying that to you this morning. Stop telling God that God can't love you. God is God, and God can love you if God wants to. Amen? <laughs> stop trying to tell God how Amen. to be God. Let Amen. God love you. And secondly, stop telling God that God made a mistake the day you were born. God did not make a mistake. God created you for a high calling with a specific purpose that only you can fulfill fill and you are a beloved child of God created in God's image deeply loved by God just the way you are today and don't let anybody ever steal that away from you Amen. that is God's purpose for your life that is the high calling that God has placed on your life now today's readings also contain some specific callings one of the callings is to happiness. Happiness, says the psalmist, comes to those who meditate on God in the day and in the night. And so we know that the practice of prayer and meditation and contemplative prayer has become increasingly difficult for us in this age of so many distractions. You know how much I love my computer and I love my iPad and my iPod and my not quite iPhone but pretty close to the same thing. And I know how much some of you love your televisions and your radios and your video games. Thank God I don't have that addiction. But you know, I have some others. You know, uh, GPS and XM and television and radio and all kinds of things. And some of us think the more we work, the better we'll be loved by our bosses and the more quickly we'll get to promotions and the more money we'll make. But I got a question for you this morning. What good is all that when you're just worn out? You know, and so I have a radical suggestion for us this morning, and here it is that we put down some of those things for 30 minutes a day and just practice meditating and contemplating the happiness that God promises us when we spend time with God. And I believe with all my heart that in just 30 minutes a day, we will become better in so many ways when we turn those gadgets off, not just put them in airplane mode, by the way, but really turn them off. Imagine how your life might change if you had 30 minutes a day of quiet time to spend with God, meditating, doing contemplative prayer, thinking about that calling that God has placed on your life and that divine purpose to which you're called. Imagine how your relationships might improve if you really sat down at the table with your family. I confess to you, this week I said to Al, we're going to clean that table off because we're going to start eating our meals at the table rather than in front of the computer or the television or whatever else we're all caught up in. We got a little cleaning to do first, but it's going to happen. 
And so no electronics allowed. And imagine what it might be like if we just spent a few minutes every day focused, mindful on prayer, talking to God about our concerns and listening back to what God has to say. Imagine how that might change our lives. And forget about shopping and running to the mall, and you can probably do without Publix for a day, or you don't have to go buy a soda or something, but just to have some quiet time of rest to sit at home and pet your puppies or your cats or to spend time with your children or your partner or to read a book or to just quietly enjoy all the beauty that's around you. you I give you permission to drive up here and use the trails and use the property, but just quiet time where you don't have to be running around all over the place. I confess again, this is very hard for me because I like to go. But imagine what it would be like to just put a comfortable chair on your front porch or on your back patio or on your deck or find a spot out here on this land and just absorb the beauty of the environment that God has planned for us. You see, it doesn't have to be complicated. I don't need to teach a course on prayer and meditation for you to figure out how to do it because it's really simple. It requires a little time and it requires a commitment to do it. And so I suggest, like the psalmist says, to become like a tree planted by the water where everything prospers and God watches over us. Another aspect of today's readings is a call, a radical call, to do justice. Make no mistake about it at all. It is not optional in the calling of God to be about the business of justice. One of the basic statements I use in my own practice of justice is this. Try it on. Quote, I stand against those who benefit from power that is built on the backs of the least of these who are excluded from its benefits. So look around the world today at people who have extreme power, corporate CEOs, Wall Street executives, heads of large banks and insurance companies and the like, <coughs> and of course, many politicians, and you will quickly find those who relish the benefits of power that is built on the backs of people who are excluded from its benefits. There's a place where reform in the name of justice is needed. Just look at all the poor people that we know, or as we're told this week, the 47% of vultures who are just draining us dry, and just get honest about the way so many of them are trapped in places where they cannot rise out of because the system has them trapped there. There's a place for reform and there's a place for justice Justice there, and imagine a Congress that would deny basic job benefits to veterans of our armed forces, even when the program was already paid for. There was no cost for it, and still in the name of politics, they voted it down. Imagine that. And there's certainly a place where radical reform and justice are needed there. Any place where we experience injustice is a place where God has called for us to be. And as I said the other night, there is no way for us to do the work of justice alone. No man can do it by himself. No woman can do it by herself. And so we all have to stand up together when we experience wars on women and women's health care and women's bodies, wars on children, wars on veterans, wars on love, Wars on the right to marry. Wars people who think against people who think differently than we do. Wars on the planet and on the environment. And war on the poor. And wars on any part of our human family. There is a place where work, the work of peace and justice are needed. And that, my sisters and brothers, are part, is part of what it means to be called to be a disciple of Jesus. To work for peace and justice for 
for everybody with no exceptions, including working for peace and justice for our planet and our environment and everything that God has created because that is what God calls disciples of Jesus to do, first through prayer and meditation and then through the work of justice and finally through a commitment to nonviolence. Let me just say how happy I am that you all embrace this work of justice, that you believe in feeding people, that you believe in taking care of people. I'm so happy that our community has a pride center. Do you know how hard it is to keep a pride center open these days? They close all around the country all the time, and it's a vital part of having a place to go when students show up here and when young people show up here and they're trying to find a positive influence on their lives for us to have that center and I'm very happy and pleased about our own support of GAP, the Gainesville Area AIDS Project who takes care of folks whose lives are affected by HIV and AIDS. And I'm so happy that this church has an ongoing and long-term commitment to participating with them and taking care of folks who are living with HIV and AIDS. And I am thrilled with what you're allowing us to do around campus ministry with LGBT students who really have very few other places to go. It's a wonderful thing for them and for us to know that there's a church where they can come, that there's a pastor who they can call, who's somebody that they can reach out to in their times of greatest need and know that we will wrap God's arms of love around them and welcome them no matter what their backgrounds are and so I'm proud of you Trinity MCC for your commitment to the work of justice I'm proud when I stand up in the community like I did on Friday night and say we are a social gospel church in the name of Jesus because that is what God has called us to be Amen. you make me proud when you live this way finally there is a call to nonviolence. Now, I confess to you, sometimes I get so aggravated with people that my first instinct is just knock their block off. <laughs> but thank you, Jesus. God has made a change in my life, and I don't have to act out on that. As I used to tell patients in the psych facility, it's okay to have those feelings. It's not okay to act on them. <laughs> So this value of nonviolence has been passed down to us through many generations. Gandhi embraced it. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. lived by it, as did so many leaders who have been called to the work of putting our faith into practice in the public arena. And we have to live by it too, even when it feels like it's the wrong thing to do. It is the right thing. Thing to do. Nonviolence is difficult and it does require great discipline. In the law of love, Gandhi writes, quote, it takes fairly strenuous course of training to attain a mental state of nonviolence. Unless there is a hearty cooperation of the mind, the mere outward observance will be simply a mask harmful both to the person, him or herself, and to others. The perfect state is reached only when mind and body and speech are in proper coordination, but it is always a case of intense mental struggle. Such a struggle leaves one stronger for it. Nonviolence is a weapon of the strong. With the weak, it might, be easily, it might easily be hypocrisy. Love wrestles with the world as with itself and ultimately gains mastery over all other feelings. Gandhi now, Jesus was the master of nonviolence, and that is why a commitment to it is essential for those who would call themselves disciples, semicolon, followers of Jesus. I think Gandhi has it right. It is such a struggle. It is such discipline. And yet we can do it. And when we master it, our lives will be stronger for it. Imagine people who sit down in the road 
and non-violently protest things that are happening inappropriately in our world. Hold arms, don't fight when the police come to arrest us, but just sit there non-violently. Imagine people, soul force, our own MCC Reverend Mel White, who sat in the front of the Southern Baptist Convention arm in arm saying, our love matters, as the police drug them off and they did not fight. Imagine Troy Perry on the street corner in Los Angeles on a hunger strike for justice. Nonviolent action. And imagine us in our community today living out the love to which God has called us. Nonviolent, consistent, strong, and powerful, and effective. We are called as disciples of Christ to prayer and meditation. We are called to social justice and we are called to non-violence. And finally, we are called to be out and proud. There are so many wonderful things happening in this small community right here on this campus. I tried to list them for you in the announcements. I'll tell the truth because I just wanted everybody to hear about it. <laughs> what all the things are you're doing in this place. There are wonderful things happening in Gainesville. There are wonderful things happening around the world. And I have news for you this morning because this is my job for the denomination. Marriage equality is coming. Why? Because it is God's will for it to be so. It is coming. As Ruth Bader Ginsburg said this week, it is going to the Supreme Court. And I believe, all the way down to my little toe, that they will rule the right way. Why? Because we've been standing up for it, for justice and equality, nonviolently for so many years. I just have to believe that I will see it. Amen. Because I do believe it is God's will. And so, my dear sisters and brothers, be disciples of Christ. Follow Christ in all you do. Meditate and pray. Do the work of justice non-violently. And be proud. Because you have so much to be proud of. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.